Hello students, my name is Vasa Naika and I'm from the Ingung Global FET College in Pietermaritzburg. Our topic for today is programmable logic controllers and hopefully we have time at the end to discuss a few examination questions. What I'm going to do first is run you through a procedure to answer typical exam questions because students normally look at the, the, the circuit and it actually looks a bit complicated and yet it's not. So the first thing we are going to do is when you get an examination question is to actually convert the circuit that's actually drawn for the PLC into symbols that you normally know which are electrical symbols. So <clears throat> this is a typical circuit that you will get in the examination question and it could probably ask you to explain it. So as we said the first thing you're going to do is look at what the circuit means in electrical terms. So if I had to now convert it to electrical terms your start switch would be a normally open switch all right. Your stop switch would be a normally closed switch and your motor contactor would be there. This would be M1.1. All right. This is your latch for your motor contactor. So this would be a normally closed, a normally open switch. M1.1. This is another switch associated with your contactor. Okay, this is a normally closed switch, M1.2, so M1.2 would be a closed switch in electrical terms, we know that, and this would represent lamp 2, okay. We will now look at the third circuit, M1.3, which is a normally open switch, and your lamp contactor, lamp contactor 2. So I'm going to draw another closed switch, sorry, open switch. Lamp 2. Okay, and now you can see it's actually going to be a bit easier to understand how the circuit works because remember, this is my live and that is my neutral bar. So current will flow, remember, we mentioned top down and from left to right. Let's look at the circuit. I can see normally open switch, yes, normally closed switch, yes, normally open. Yes, normally closed, normally closed, normally open, normally open, and my three contactors. The second thing you do, all right, is look at what is happening to the circuit before any switches are pressed or before I energize any part of the circuit. What is actually going on? All right, now in order to do that, you follow the current parts. Uh, if I look at the first rung, all right, I'm going to be, have to stop at that point because no current can flow past here. So up to there, nothing can happen. If I look at the second rung, up to there, nothing can happen because open circuit, no current flows. If I look at the third run, current can flow right across. Okay, so if I look at lamp 2, it's actually on. And remember now, this is before I actually pressed any start or stop button. If I look at the fourth rung, current can only flow up to that point, stop there because it's an open circuit. So in the normal state, that is what happens. Okay? I can now proceed to answer any other questions that are asked about that particular circuit, whether they ask you to explain the operation or explain what would happen if uh, the start button is pressed or explain what happened if M1.1 doesn't energize, etc. The third thing to look at uh, if you are asked basically to explain a circuit with faults. So let's just say uh, they ask you to explain the circuit here and um, let's, okay, we'll leave the same one, it's fine. Um,
Okay, what would happen if the stop button does not close? Okay, and then they would say, okay, the second part is two. What would happen if M1.1 does not energize? And this is after pressing start. Okay, so let's look at the question. After you press the start button, what would happen if the stop button does not close or is not closed or refuses to close? So you will look at that fault and remove that stop button because now it is not part of the circuit anymore. And you will answer what would happen if the start button is closed. When you are looking at the next question, you replace your start button or your stop button, sorry, and you would ignore this question completely. And now you look at as if that's the only question, what would happen if M1.1 does not energize. So what would happen if this does not energize? And you would answer the question as follows. The next tip um, when you are answering examination questions or past paper questions as you would like to call it. Is when you are given a question to design. All right, I'm just going to read this one here. It says, a ladder logic diagram with a 10 second delay. Uh, design a ladder logic diagram with a 10 second delay on timer and two lights. Initially, light A is on, and after a period of 10 seconds, light B goes on, and normally, uh, and light A goes off. The timer coil must have two sets of contacts, one set of normally open contacts, and one set of normally closed contacts. So before you can answer the question, the first thing you do is actually look at how many inputs I have and how many outputs I have. So in this case, I have a timer coil. I have two inputs, light A and light, sorry, two outputs, light A and light B, and two inputs, a normally open contact and a normally closed contact. So let's look at it. For an input, if I look at my input, so I'm gonna, before I even start designing, I'm gonna say inputs, I have a normally open contact. And that's that. Okay? I have a normally closed contact. I have two lights on my output. So, my outputs, remember, I'm going to re represent them as coils. Light A. And... Light B. And I also have a timer, all right? So timer will be an output, and we'll say T1, timer. And the time that it said it must time for is 10 seconds. So it will be 10 seconds. I now have listed my inputs and my outputs. I now need to give them addresses, so that when I'm designing the program, I still don't make a mistake and repeat addresses. So because these are outputs, they're all going to be Y. So I can say light A is Y001. Light B, Y002. Timer, Y003. Or in some cases, I could just use T1. Now, remember the question said that these normally open contacts and these normally closed contacts belong to the timer, all right? So, the addresses for these contacts would be T1, and for the normally closed contacts would be T1, okay? I now have all my inputs and outputs. I have my addresses. I can now continue to design the circuit. Let's look at a typical example, all right? It says, explain the operation of the ladder diagram in figure four below. Okay, we have a normally open contact, a normally closed contact, and a coil CR1. We then have a latching contact CR1. We then have two normally open switches A 
B CR2. Okay, N. Okay, and now let's go to the procedure that we mentioned earlier on. We said the first thing you do is in pencil on the side, just draw the circuit using normal electrical symbols. All right, so using normal electrical symbols on the side, I'm going to have a normally open switch, which is normally a start, a normally closed switch, and my contactor. All right, I'm going to have a normally open, which is CR1, CR1. I'm going to have two switches, okay, they call them A and B, so normally open, normally open, CR2. Let's just do it a bit neater. And end. Okay. And then we said, in the normal state, this is what the circuit is, in the normal state. Okay, that is off. So if I look at the first rung, no current can flow there, no current can flow there, no current can flow there, and that's my end. I can now explain what would happen. All right, the, the question specifically says explain. When you do that, it is also important that you explain in steps. Don't say start with if this is closed or if that is closed. Start in order. Remember what we said is how does the PLC read? It reads from top down, left to right. So the first, normally this would be a start button and this would be a stop button. So I will say, one, if the start button is pressed, what would happen? And then you physically go and press it in your diagram. So take your pencil, close it. All right? And you would write here, A, hey, this is your answer now. If the start button is pressed, Let's look at what would happen, all right? You can see that current will flow and CR1 will be energized. So you will write that down. If the start button is pressed, CR1 will be energized. Okay, the second thing you have to look for if a coil is energized, is it going to stay on? So what do we have to look for? We have to look for a latching circuit. Do we have a latching circuit? Yes, there's my latching circuit here because it's got the same address CR1 as my coil. So I will say, if the start button is pressed, CR1 will be energized and it will latch itself with the switch CR1, okay? And then what it means, that will close. So even if I now release the start button, current will flow here, my contactor will stay energized. What happens next? All right, just to put the address of this normally closed here, they actually call it CR2. This is CR2, and that's done. Okay? What happens next? Let's look at it. All right, I've finished with the first rung. I've looked at the second rung. My contactor is energized. I have a latching circuit. I can now proceed. If there was no latching circuit here, nothing else would happen, all right? Because the contactor is not energized. So now that it is energized and it is latched, let's look at what happens here. What would happen if I close switch A? All right, so if B, if switch A is closed, let's look at it. Okay, current will flow through switch A, yes. 
But it will stop here. Okay? So what would happen? If switch A is closed, nothing would change. Because switch B is open. All right, let's go back. Let's open switch A again. What would happen if I close switch B? Okay, so I will say if switch B is closed. Once again, will there be any current flow through this contactor? No, because switch A is open. So you stated, if switch B is closed, nothing would happen. Because switch A is open. Okay, and then this actually brings us back to, remember we discussed the AND function, in order for something to work, both A and B has to be energized, and that would be the last option. Okay, if I now close both A and B, and let's close it. All right, you will find that now I will have current flow from my live to my neutral, and CR2 will be energized, so stated. If both A and B are closed, comma, CR2 will be energized. So what if CR2 is energized? Well, let's look at the circuit. Remember that this normally closed switch here is associated with CR2. So actually we should have written it. Oh, it's fine now. Should have drawn it like that. So that normally closed switch is associated with CR2. And the moment CR2 is energized, that changes state. If that changes state, it means from closed, it goes to open. What would happen? Okay, you would find there would be a break in the circuit. Okay, CR1 would be de-energized. So if both A and B are closed, CR2 will be energized, comma, or full stop. The normally closed contact CR2 will open and CR1 or output CR1 will be de-energized. Okay, so you can see that doing it in sequence, first drawing the electrical diagram and then looking at each step from the top to the bottom, you have now completely answered the question because you have now answered the third part of the question. Let's look at um, another example. Okay, they say, design a ladder logic diagram where two timers are used to turn on two lights sequ sequentially in the following manner. Light 1 should turn on when the start button is depressed. Five seconds later, light 2 should go off and light, so light 1 should go off and light 2 should turn on. Five seconds later, light 2 should go off and light 1 should come on. This process should repeat itself. So, firstly, we're going to have two lights, two timers. All right, and remember what we said is your lights Your timer one timer two and a start button okay we said first list them all then remember 
which are my outputs. And which are my inputs. Okay, we then said you give them addresses. So light one, I could say, is Y001. Light two, Y002. For timers, we're just going to call them T. So that's T1 and that's T2. And remember, both timers are five seconds. Five seconds. Okay, so when the start button is pressed, I want light one to come on. So let's draw the circuit. Okay, so for my start button, remember it's an input. It is normally open and I'm going to use X's, so X001. Remember for all my inputs we said we're going to use the notation X. For all the outputs we're going to use the notation Y. So I'm going to draw my start button and Okay, now you can see, if I depress the start button, all right, what would happen? The contactor here for light one would energize, okay, but would it not hold because I haven't included a latching circuit. So immediately now, Y001 must latch itself, so I will include a normally open circuit here, uh, sorry, a normally open switch here, which I will also call Y001 because this latch must have the same address as my contactor. Five seconds later I want that to actually turn off. So I'm going to have to have a timer. Something must start my timer and I'm going to call this T1 and timer five seconds. When do I start the timer? Okay, as soon as the light comes on. How do I know the light is on? Y001 is energized. So, once again, Y001 will start the timer. The address of the switch would be Y001. What happens after five seconds? Okay, after five seconds, the timer must start light two. So, This would be light two. Okay, what starts light two? The timer T1. So this normally open switch will have the same address as timer T1. Okay, now it also says that timer T1 switches off light one. How do I switch something off? I break the circuit. How do I break the circuit? Okay, by having initially a normally closed switch all right and calling it t1 the same address as timer one so if timer one is energized two things would happen one it will switch on light two secondly it will break the circuit here and switch off light one now let's look at after light two is on, they want another timer to time for five seconds. So this would be T2, five seconds. I will call this, remember to forget, to, don't forget to put your addresses. So what would switch on timer T2? Okay, it would be light Y002. And you find now, once the light two comes on, T1 turns it on, it turns that off, okay? But it also at the same time starts timer T2. Don't forget, T2 or Y002 will only stay on for as long as it latches itself. So I should have actually put in uh, latch. Always don't forget.
So this would be y002. And then now this would be t2, 5 seconds. And the address for here would be y002. So y002 latches itself as well as turns on timer t2. What happens after another 5 seconds? Timer T2 energizes, okay, and we want it to turn light 2 off. So just like we did T1 turning light 1 off, we're going to put a normally closed switch here, and we're going to call that T2. So after 5 seconds, T2 would actually switch light 2 off. But they say this process should repeat itself indefinitely. So indefinitely means um, to start the whole process again, I must not press the start switch. It must start automatically. How would I do that? Well, you'll find once I reach the stage, timer T2 has timed five seconds, it switched this light off, I want to switch. So basically I need to go back to the top and switch this light on. Now, if you remember previously, we discussed the OR function. So all I have to do here to say that I'm just going to create some space. And this switch can also switch that light on. What would be address of this switch? It would be T2. OK, so meaning that after five seconds, this timer energizes. It now closes this, and it can switch on light one again, and the process will continue indefinitely. And the only thing that you need to add is your end statement. All right? They have not asked you to put uh, emergency stop, etc. But just in case, they did ask you to put in a stop switch to stop the whole process. What you would do at that point remember that's T1. At that point, you will put in a stop switch, okay, and that would be stop. Okay, so I hope you understood the procedure for the design questions. Always please start with listing your inputs and outputs. Give them their respective addresses. Uh, always we're using the X notation for out inputs and the Y notation for outputs. And always put your addresses at the top. Okay, because your addresses are what the PLC actually understands. Unfortunately, I wish we had time to discuss a few more questions. I've listed quite a few here for you, but uh, due to time constraints, we're going to have to leave it for the next time. I hope to see you soon. And please remember, keep safe, sanitize, stay home, and look after yourself. Thank you.